Welcome back into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I am your host, Scott Bernstein, another quick hitter edition. Uh, we're winding up summer 2023, and the OG pod wants to pay our respects to a handful of wise guys across the country that cash in their chips over the last couple of months, uh, have gone to that big social club in the sky. Some of them are, were on witness protection. Some of them, you know, lived uh, in their 90s. So let's start off with the biggest name here, Frank Curley Lino, a uh, longtime capo in the Bonanno crime family who died in witness protection, but uh, was a major shot caller in, in the Bonanos in the 80s, 90s, into the 2000s when he went down with uh, boss Joe Messino and uh, decided to, before Joe Messino joined Team USA, Frank Lino uh, jumped into the warm embrace of the federal government. Uh, Lino dodged death famously in the 1981 Three Capo Slains, the uh, the purge within the Bonanno crime family depicted in the movie Donnie Brasco, uh, where Three Capo, Sonny Red, and Delicado, uh, Big Trini Trinchera, Trinchera and uh, Phil Lucky Giancone uh, were all Lord to what was supposed to be a, a peace conference at a club called the 2020 Club in Brooklyn. Lino was with those guys. Uh, they showed up and the shooting started. Joe Massino's guys were there to slaughter everybody. Lino bolted out a back door before he was killed. Uh, Trinchera and Delicato and, and Diaconi are killed. Massino and Rusty Rastelli take power. Uh, in the Bananos, they, they get rid of the threat that was being posed by that group led by Sonny and Delicato. And Frank Lino not only survives it, but is promoted afterwards, uh, takes over the crew uh, of, of Bruno and Delicato, Sonny Red's son, who had been a, uh, a captain at a very young age after taking part in the Carmine Galante assassination. And he's put on uh, the shelf at that point, averts a murder contract. He had a 30-day you know, hit on his head that the commission told the Bonanos they had 30 days to kill Bruno uh, or, or he would get a pass. He, he ran out the clock, if you will. And you know, Bruno's still standing right now, uh, got released from prison after another incident having nothing to do with stuff in the 80s. Uh, and he's about 76 years old and uh, living his best life as, as a free man. But uh, Frank Lino uh, survived it, became an acting capo in, in 81, full capo in 85, uh, and then ends up flipping in 2003 or four. Uh, so, you know, came from a long line of May guys, brothers. Uh, I believe his dad was a May guy and uh, brought his, his son in and, and, and had a lot of uh, – a lot of Linos in, in the New York five families. So uh, Frank Curley Lino passed away, uh, staying on the East Coast, out in Providence, an associate of the patriarchal crime family, Harpo uh, Garabadian, Charles Garabadian, who everyone called Harpo, was a driver and uh, messenger, driver and messenger for uh former capo Bobby the, C the Cigar De Luca, and helped Bobby the Cigar get rid of Stevie DeSaro's body, the nightclub owner who was murdered in Boston in 1993, and buried in Providence. Uh, Cadillac Frank Salemi and DeSaro had a falling out over a business venture, the belief that DeSaro was, was stealing from him and was going to uh, give him up to the feds. Cadillac Frank kills him, and hands the body over to Bobby the Cigar, his right hand in Providence to get rid of uh, DeSaro's corpse. And Bobby DeLuca assigns his brother Joe and Harpo Garibadian uh, to get rid of the body. They buried it behind an old textile mill. Body got dug up back in 2016. Salemi's put on trial for it. Bobby DeLuca is the star witness. Salemi's convicted. The DeLuca brothers both testified. Joe DeLuca died earlier this summer. We gave him, uh, you know, 
we, we, we told everyone about his passing and, and called it up for you last month. So he's not going to make it in this, uh, in this video of, of paying our respects, but, uh, Harpo Garibadian had actually died before him, but we didn't find out about it. He died in April, but Harpo, when, when Bobby was in his glory as a, a, a big time mafia player in new England, Harpo Garibadian was his shadow and, and drove him everywhere. Uh, back in the late 80s, Bobby DeLuca, before he was even a made guy, was almost personally responsible for making the peace uh, between the warring factions in that family, representing Providence and Boston, respectively. He was the one that was middling for uh, the Patriarcha a Junior crew and Vinny uh, Ferrara, the animal, and uh, uh, J.R. Russo, who, you know, for all... Bobby DeLuca's flaws, and I'm sure if you talk to guys in Providence, there's they they would have a long list of complaints. But he was a guy that was very adept at politicking between mafia organizations, um, and the fact that he was trusted uh, wasn't even a made guy, but he was trusted to middle for these two, you know, the the two warring factions in new england at that time shows you how much respect he got eventually got made a couple months after that his brother joe deluca got made for taking part in the stevie DeSaro murder uh, harpo garibadian was armenian so he couldn't get made but uh he was on the witness list for that 2018 cadillac frank salemi trial was given immunity never testified to his dying day he insisted he had nothing to do with the Stevie DeSaro murder, I'm sure federal prosecutors might tell you differently, but uh, Harpo Garibadian was around all of uh, everything, all the craziness that was going on in New England in the late 80s into the early 90s. Harpo Garibadian had a, had a front row seat to it as uh, as the driver and right hand man to Bobby the Cigar De Luca. So he passed away. Uh, let's let's move over into the Midwest. Uh, talk about uh, a guy, a very underrated mob presence uh, from the Pennsylvania, from the state of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, Cesar Montevecchio uh, was from you know Erie, Pennsylvania. Did a lot of work. Uh, was a was a high end burglar and thief. Uh, did a lot of work with multiple crime families: Pittsburgh, Cleveland, some of the five families: Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia. Uh, he was kind of a utility player. And his name uh, came up as a suspect in the two most notorious gangland slains in Erie, Pennsylvania history. Uh, Montevecchio eventually pled guilty uh, a, a third degree homicide in the 1983 murder of uh, uh, Frank Bolo Dovishaw, who was the city's biggest bookmaker. Uh, Montevecchio and a group of other people from other uh, crime families wanted a piece of that book or wanted the entire book, uh, and, and they killed him for it. And, you know, in terms of headline grabbing, the 1980 murder of uh, a, a police officer in Erie, uh, you know, I think if you talk to people in Erie, it's the most iconic unsolved murder in, in the history of Erie. And uh, the, 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 the police officer's last name was Owen, and he was shot uh, while on patrol. There's never been any arrests, a lot of investigation. I believe the investigation is still open to today. Uh, back at that time when Montevecchio was running burglary rackets in that area, he had, you know, hordes of police officers on the payroll. Um, it was alleged that this officer Owen was one of those uh, people and uh, was hours away from having to retake a polygraph exam um, from investigators related to this string of robberies that Montevecchio was allegedly at the, uh, the forefront of. And the night before he was supposed to take that polygraph, he was shot. That was in 1980. Montevecchio always claimed he had nothing to do with it and was never charged, but his name surfaced as a suspect. Um, came out of, you know, he eventually testified against people in the Bolashaw case. 
did like seven or eight years, came out of prison in the 90s and retired. He's been, you know, had gone dark the last 25 years of his life. Um, in Ohio, old, old time bookie, Tony Arnone. I believe he was in his 90s or late 80s. He passed away this spring, went all the way back to the uh, Scalish crime family uh, in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s. He was a uh, very highly connected to the top levels of the, of the Cleveland Mafia, uh, very close to slain underboss Leo Lips Mosheri, very close to Joe Gallo, uh, not the Joe Gallo from New York, the Joe Gallo uh, Mafia capital in, in, in Cleveland. Jack White, Angie Leonardo, Arnone was based in, in Akron, uh, home of LeBron James, uh, where Le or Leo, Mo uh, Leo Mosheri lived. And Arnone uh, ran a, a, a huge book, uh, major sports book, one of the biggest books in all of Ohio. And again, went back all the way to the late 50s, 60s. So he cashed in his chips. And then the last name I'm going to mention, uh, out of Philly, this guy was an Irish mob guy, John Boggs, part of the famous k and gang, the Irish mafia in Philly. He passed away this summer. I was in his late 70s, 80s. And, uh, you know, the one thing I'll say, you know, this guy, the k and guy, uh, they were, they didn't just stay put in in Philadelphia. Uh, their, their burglary crews went all across the country. And uh, Boggs and, and the guys that were running those K&A burglary crews, uh, you know, went, spent time in North Carolina, Houston, California, uh, doing big jobs. And uh, one of the things, that, one anecdote I'll show, I'll, I'll share before we leave that I know Boggs was, was quoted as saying is that those guys, uh, when they'd get into a house and they would see a, like a crucifix, they would know it was a Catholic house and their, their hearts would dip. Because they knew that there was no money there. But when they broke into a house and they saw uh, a mezuzah or a Star of David, um, and it was a Jewish house, uh, they all there, they all lit up like a Christmas tree because they knew that all those Jewish women kept all their jewelry uh, in the house and, and that they were going to have a field day. So uh, just an interesting story from Johnny Boggs and how the, the mind of a, of, a, of a cat burglar. So uh, those five guys all passed away in 2023. We wanted to just let everybody know that uh, they're up in that social club up in the sky. Check back into OG Pod for another full-length episode this week with my partner in crime, Jimmy B. Thanks for Ben behind the glass. I'll see you next time. Scott Bernstein, OG Pod out.